Roberta, Phoebe, what are you looking at? I want to see. Oh my gosh, Dr. Z, I'm so glad you're here. Maybe you can help us identify these weird wiggly things I found in my stream. Okay, well, Phoebe actually found them, but I think they're so cool. I thought they'd be a perfect subject for the video we're making. You're making a video? Yeah. I think I might want to be a wildlife reporter someday when I grow up, like Olivia and Michelle. They get to go to all the wild places, like New Zealand and Montana. I want to do that. Plus, I think I'd be a great wildlife reporter, considering well, I am wildlife. You know what I mean? You know, Roberta, I think you're quite right. I think you would be an excellent wildlife reporter. I'll tell you what, why don't you do the opening announcements to practice, and then we'll see if we can identify those creatures in your habitat. Oh, okay, Dr. Z. I got this. Hello, friends, and welcome to San Diego Zoo Kids Corner. We can't wait to share all our stories and adventures with you. So let's explore the animal world together. As always, buckle up, because we're about to bring the zoo to you. All right, Roberta, tell me about this fish that you found in your habitat. Well, it was a warm, sunny Wednesday, and Phoebe and I were looking in the river in my habitat, and we noticed a bunch of tiny fish swimming in the water. I said, these look like fish, and got ready to film. But you know Phoebe, she's so curious. She didn't think they were fish at all. Okay, okay, I'll tell him. Dr. Z, Phoebe thinks these wiggly things in the water are frog babies. I don't think I've ever seen baby frogs, but these don't look like frogs I've ever seen. Baby zebra looks like zebras. Baby lions look like lions with less hair. And even baby iguanas still look like iguanas. These animals are swimming in the water. They have tails, and it looks like they even have gills. They have to be fish. Phoebe says they can walk on land. Is that even possible, Dr. Z? <laughs> a fish walking on land, Roberta? That would be quite the sight. But in fact, our friend Kim from Jacksonville, Florida, had the same wild wonder. And Olivia leaped at the opportunity to investigate. Let's see what she found out. When we think of a fish, we usually think of a streamlined creature covered in scales, equipped with fins used to propel its body through the water, and gills that allow it to breathe underwater. We don't often think of fish as creatures that can walk on land, let alone live on land. Which brings us to today's Wild Wonder. Can a fish live on land? Well, yes they can, but not permanently. Some species of fish are able to leave the water for extended periods of time. For example, the mud skipper. These mudskippers live at Sea Life Melbourne and they are what's known as an amphibious fish, meaning they show characteristics similar to an amphibian, like a frog. They have similar eyes to a frog and they are capable of absorbing oxygen through their skin, just like a frog too. Mudskippers also hold water in their gill chambers, which they use to breathe whilst they aren't submerged underwater. Kind of like how a scuba diver would use an oxygen tank to breathe underwater. When they are spending time on land, they must always keep their skin moist. So you'll most likely find mud skippers close to water near mangroves, mud flats and estuaries in humid habitats. They even have to keep their eyes moist, but that's easy for them. All they have to do is roll their eyes back into their water-filled eye sockets. And they're pretty good at getting around on land too. They use their forelimbs to propel themselves forward, and their tail fin also helps with stability. So when it comes time to get their water fix once more, they can walk right back into the creek or stream with no dramas. See, Dr. Z, that proves two of my points. These little wiggly things in my river are fish, and Olivia gets to go to all the cool places as a wildlife reporter. I think you're missing the point completely, Roberta. 
those creatures in your habitat don't look like mud skippers at all. Well, I feel like a fish out of water, Dr. Z. I did hear Olivia say the mud skippers were amphibious fish, and then she compared them to amphibians like frogs. I know that amphibians can live both in and near water. If a fish, like the mud skipper, can be found living in water and on land, how can we tell if an animal is an amphibian? You know, Roberta, as a wildlife reporter, you've got a responsibility to report things accurately, to make sure that things are correct. And I think you're starting to realize that those creatures in your habitat aren't fish at all. So let's take the frog angle. So fish, like the mud skipper, have got scales, like birds and reptiles. And many people are surprised to figure out that these animals are not slimy. They're actually smooth and dry. Like this beautiful little girl over here, the red-tailed boa. When I touch her, just smooth and dry. The real masters of slime are, get that drum roll going please, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, amphibian. A frog's skin is smooth that they need to keep moist at all times, and that's why they live near water. And people always wonder, what do frogs feel like? Well, we're gonna make some slime, just so you know. My three ingredients are tapioca pudding. And look at that, it's already jiggly and gross looking. I got applesauce and some steel cut oats. Okay, I'm gonna take even amounts of the tapioca pudding. Ugh, look how jiggly that is. And I'm gonna mix that together with an equal amount of our applesauce. Gonna mix those together. Those two might just taste good. Let me have a taste to see, because they both seem like they'd be delicious. Gross. Okay, let's add in our steel cut oats to give it that nice texture. There we go. I would like this to be purple slime. Not sure why, but that's the color I have chosen. So I have got some blue food coloring over there. There goes the blue food coloring. And I'm gonna mix that together with some red food coloring. There we go, and if all goes well, that should give us a nice purple slime. You know, before the show started, I made this big batch of slime that I am hoping to use in today's trivia. I cannot wait. Look at that. Delicious purple you. Whoa! Dr. Z, that is some wild looking slime. Phoebe says we need to check on the animals in the stream. Stat! Look at that! They're growing legs! Phoebe, turn the camera on. We have to capture some of this for. Oh, and yes, Phoebe, you were right. These are definitely not fish. They must be some kind of amphibian. Phoebe still insists they're frogs, but I've never seen a frog with a tail before. Well, you know, Roberta, when a wildlife reporter doesn't know an answer, what should she do? Ask an expert. Ask an expert, you're quite right. And I just so happen to know some experts about amphibians with tails at the St. Louis Zoo. Let's check in with them and maybe they can even help identify the mystery amphibian in your stream. Hi everybody, I'm Amanda. And I'm Brian. And we're here at the St. Louis Zoo to talk to you about how we raise hellbenders. I'm gonna to talk to you about how we raise the hellbenders from eggs to adults. And I'm gonna to talk to you about how we create the aquarium systems that we use to raise the hellbenders. Now let's go get started. So here at the St. Louis Zoo, we're raising Ozark hellbenders because they're a federally listed endangered species. And we're raising them up from eggs all the way until we are able to release them back into the wild. Ozark hellbenders are found in southern Missouri and northern Arkansas. Hellbenders are a type of salamander, which is an amphibian, and that means that they live very close or in the water. Hellbenders can get up to about two feet long. Um, they kind of have a flat body. Their head is very flat because it allows them to get underneath these rocks that they live in on the bottom of the stream. And they're really kind of unique too because they have a very long kind of rudder-like tail. It's kind of flat, which helps them swim through the water. We actually have eggs. 
some that are collected from the wild. And we put them into our egg tray systems and we take care of them in those egg trays until they hatch. And then once they hatch out, we put them into critter keepers inside of larger tanks. And it takes them another six to eight weeks before they actually start eating. And once they start eating, it's a lot of work for the keepers because we go through with little pipettes, like little eyedroppers, and put the food in front of all the hellbenders so we make sure that they're all growing. As they get older, they get out of those critter keepers and go into the larger tanks. And we still continue to feed them. We feed them different food items as they get older. When the animals first start eating, they're eating little tiny foods because they're very tiny animals. So they get things like brine shrimp, and then as they get older, they start getting a lot more live food items. So we'll feed them ghost shrimp. Sometimes we get crayfish for them, and we feed them fish, um, and then also krill and a lot of other different frozen food items for them. So here at the St. Louis Zoo, we have over 4,000 hellbenders and we go through and we weigh and measure all of them at least every six months. And the way that we can track the animals is that they actually have a chip, just like they put in cats and dogs. Um, and we can scan that chip and we know which animal it is. So now that we've learned how we raise hellbenders, let's take it over to Brian and learn how we take care of over 4,000 of them here at the St. Louis Zoo. Thanks, Amanda. We're down here at the Ron Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation, where we have over 250 different individual hellbender aquariums. Just like your aquarium at home, we measure everything from water quality to temperature and oxygen in our exhibits here. For our hellbenders, we have several different types of systems for different sizes of hellbenders, from eggs to juveniles, all the way to adults. And you can see indoors, we actually have a man-made stream where hellbenders lay their eggs. So this is a really cool feature on our indoor stream system. It's called a biofilter and it helps oxygenate the water as well as promote healthy bacteria in the system. It may look like a construction site in here, but hellbenders love to hide. So we give them PVC pipes and tiles to help mimic their natural behavior in the wild. So I love my job and I love taking care of hellbenders because I know that if it weren't for us working with them, they'd probably be gone within the next 20 years or so. And knowing that I am helping to save them and to save this species makes my job completely worthwhile and it makes me love it even more. Okay, let's see if I have this right. Tadpoles. Check. Tails, check. Slimy skin, check. Living in water, check. I think the creatures in my stream might be hellbender salamanders. You know, Roberta, there's a whole variety when it comes to amphibians. We've learned about frogs, we've learned about the hellbender salamanders, and it's time to show our friends the wide world of amphibians. It's trivia time. So I was working in the lab when one of my PhD students walked in. It was PhD student, Mr. Bidness. And he said to me, Professor Me, because that's my name, Professor M-E-A-H, Me. I said, please, Mr. Bidness, call me by my first name. It's Sylvester, but you can call me Sly. And he said, Professor Sly, Me. I'm thinking of writing another paper about amphibians. Could you help me choose an amphibian? Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. Name an amphibian. And he said, a frog. I said, name another amphibian. And he said, another frog. And I realized that we were in trouble. So I came up with some trivia for my PhD students. And I'm going to give you that same trivia right now. I'm going to give you the names of three animals. Only one of them is an amphibian. Name the amphibian and you will be safe. But if you get it wrong, you could be slimed. Question number one. Which of these three animals is an amphibian? Is it A, the turtle, B, the axolotl, or C, a platypus? It's the axolotl. The axolotl is a species of salamander found in Mexico and differ from most other salamanders in that they live permanently in water. 
Which of these three animals is an amphibian? Is it A, the newt, B, the legless lizard, or C, the water snake? The answer is the newt. Here's a fun newt fact for you. A unique species called the Emperor Spotted Newt survives in the dry shrublands of Iran. And unlike other amphibians, this hardy newt spends the majority of its time on land. Question number three. Which of these three animals is an amphibian? Is it A, the eel, B, the earthworm, or C, the Sicilian? It's the Sicilian. Sicilians get their names from the Latin word blind or hidden. While most adult amphibians have legs, the Sicilian has no legs. And now for the bonus question. Am I, Professor Sly Me, an amphibian or not? Wait, wait, I'm not an amphibian, wait! Ah! <laughs> Yuck. Ugh. You know, Roberta, I have got a really good feeling about this week's jokes. You've got this newfound confidence as a wildlife reporter. Amphibians is an excellent topic for jokes. I think you're going to do really well. In fact, Phoebe, I think we need to record this week. Roberta needs to put this on her reel. In fact, I'm going to give you an introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's welcome to the stage the one and only joking zebra. Here's Roberta. OK, here we go. What do you call a lying salamander? An amphibian? What do you call amphibian poop? Toadstool. Here is a joke from our friend Teddy. Where do fish keep their money? In their riverbank. <laughs> and another joke from our friend Enzo. What happens to a frog's car when it breaks down? It gets towed away. <laughs> Roberta, this is so exciting. Do you know what this means? It's not a fish. It's not a hellbender salamander. It's a frog. And do you know what that means? Phoebe was right all along. Frogs and toads are amphibians with strong jumping legs and webbed feet as adults. And their tails disappear towards the tail end of their life cycle. <laughs> Thank goodness I'm not a frog. I couldn't imagine losing my tail. I... Beautiful, beautiful tail. Imagine going from gills to lungs. In fact, my identical twin brother, Chef Zulittle, is going to take us through a culinary tour of the amazing process of metamorphosis. Welcome, my friends. Mm -hmm. Chef Zulittle here. And today, mm -hmm. I have a tasty treat for you that is going to celebrate the life cycles mm -hmm. of a frog. Come, let me show you. Let's have a look at what we are going to need for today. Beginning with the hardware, we are going to need one non-stick frying pan, small to medium size there. We're going to need one large spatula, and then we're going to need some of your favorite recipe of pancake batter. Now you can see that I have mine in these two squeeze bottles here. I have left one plain, and to the other I have added some green food coloring. Now with that we'll also need a little bit of butter, a banana, a strawberry, and a few blueberries. Here we go. Now the first stage of the frog life cycle is of course the eggs. And to represent the eggs, today we are going to use banana slices paired with blueberries. Just grab yourself a slice of banana and then using a spoon, gently scoop out a small well right there in the middle of the banana. That'll give a nice resting spot for the blueberry to settle in just like so. Marvelous, there we have a lovely representation of stage one, the eggs. 
Stage two of the frog life cycle is, of course, the tadpole. And to do our tadpoles, we are going to have our pan over medium low heat, well buttered. Grab your squeeze bottle filled with the green pancake mix, and we shall begin by drawing the outline of the tadpole's body. You can see we have a nice skinny body with a long wavy tail. Draw that outline and then just very gently fill in the middle. Let that cook over the medium low heat for a couple of minutes and when you start to see the air bubbles appear, that is our indicator that it is time to flip. Grab your large spatula, work it very gently underneath your tadpole, give it a flip, let that cook for another minute or so, and then gently remove it to a plate. Stage three of the frog life cycle is of course the froglet. And before we grab the pancake mix, we are going to very gently and carefully drop two blueberries right there into the pan. Those are going to serve as the eyes of the froglet. Now we grab our green squeeze bottle and we once again do a little outline of the froglet's body. Now this means that the froglet still has a little bit of a tail there left over from the tadpole stage, but with the froglet we of course also start to see the limbs forming. So we're going to incorporate that We've got the limbs there, we've got the shape of the body, and again, a little bit of tail left over. And then once we have the outline, we just fill in the rest of the interior. Frogs come in all different colors, but I have decided to make mine green. As before, we're going to let this cook for a couple of minutes. This one can be a little bit tricky. Use that nice big spatula to very gently work it underneath your froglet and then give it a flip, cook on the other side for about a minute or so, and then once again, gently remove to a plate. We have reached the fourth and final stage of the frog life cycle, and that is, of course, the adult frog. And we begin, as before, with our blueberries for the pupils of the eyes. And then here's a little something new. We're going to very carefully add to the pan a curved slice of strawberry, and this will serve as the frog's smile. Next up, we grab the uncolored pancake batter, and very carefully trace around the blueberries for the frog's eyes. After that, we will grab the green pancake batter and complete the tracing of the outline of the frog's face and then fill in the interior. As before, we'll let this cook for a couple of minutes. When you see those air bubbles come up, gently flip. Cook on the second side for just a minute or so, and then carefully remove to a plate. And here it is, my friends, our finished product. The eggs, the tadpole, the froglet, and then of course the smiling face of our full-grown adult frog. Looks good enough to eat, don't you think? Well, there you have it, my friends. Delicious and educational. Thank you so much for joining me. I am Chef Zulittle. See you next time. And the cycle is complete. Chef Z also mentioned another amazing thing about frogs. They come in many different colors. Some are brightly colored, but our frogs are kind of brownish green. Why do frogs come in such a variety of colors? Well, you know, Olivia recently met up with some colorful frogs all the way in Australia. Let's see what she learned. animals use bright colours as a warning sign to potential predators. In most cases, colours like these mean back off, I'm poisonous. And in this case, it's 100% accurate. You're looking at a corroboree frog. This species secretes a toxic substance from its skin, which would make it very unappetising as a snack. Quite a handy defence mechanism to have, though. But unfortunately for the corroboree frog, this species is in trouble. So corroboree frogs are critically endangered. They're actually one of Australia's most critically endangered species. They are native to the snowy mountain ranges of New South Wales, where much of the habitat is protected by national parks. And they're poisonous to eat. So what is the cause of their decline? 
Well, they suffer from a disease known as chytrid fungus, which is unfortunately affecting amphibians worldwide. Basically what happens is the fungus will cover the skin where there's any keratin. Now considering that frogs will breathe through their skin, it makes it very difficult for them to then breathe. It also can affect their nervous system as well. So the keepers at Taronga Zoo are doing everything they can to help these beautiful Aussie natives out by running a very successful breeding program. Taronga is heavily involved in breeding and releasing corroboree frogs back into the wild. As part of the National Recovery Program, we have released hundreds of frogs and thousands of eggs as well back into Mount Kosciuszko. It's not easy to successfully breed that many frogs. It takes a lot of dedication and hard work from the keepers every day. They know exactly which frog is which by photographing them and keeping records and each frog is sorted into a group based on which stage it's at in its life cycle. The keepers also need to keep the room at the correct temperature to make sure the frogs are comfortable. And males and females are kept separate until it's time for breeding. It's a big job, but it's worth it. They are one of the most iconic Australian species that we do have here. They play a very important part of the alpine ecosystem. Even as teeny tiny little tadpoles, they actually eat all of the algae in all the ponds, which means it's crystal clear for all of the other animals and plant life there too. So it's thanks to breeding programs like this one that corroboree frogs are given a fighting chance in the wild. can serve as a warning to predators that they are poisonous. Amphibian skin is so fascinating. We learned that all amphibians have the mind-boggling ability to breathe through their skin. How does that work exactly? Well, I know just the person who's going to be able to help us answer that question. My identical twin brother. Hello, Dr. R. Zulil here. Did you know that one of the characteristics of an amphibian is they can breathe through their skin? Can you do that? I didn't think so. So, to illustrate how they can do this, we have an experiment. You, what you'll need is you'll need a uh, small jar or a cup. You'll need a large jar of uh, cold water. You'll need rubber bands, scissors, and paper towel. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut the paper towel into squares that are uh, that just fit over the top of your jar or cup. You're also going to need warm water to fill the cup. There we go. Fill the cup with warm water. And of course, it wouldn't be an experiment without food coloring. Yes, that's the last ingredient that you'll need, food coloring. So you are going to put food coloring into the cup of warm water. There we go. All right, there we go. Now, we're going to put the paper towel over the cup, over the top of the cup, there we go. And then you're gonna take a rubber band and secure that paper towel over the cup. There we go. The next step is to drop the cup into the big jar of water. Once you've done that, We'll watch and see what happens. You see, the paper towel is like the amphibian skin. It'll take water in and out of the skin, which is where they get their oxygen from. Well, that concludes our experiment. Thank you so much. Our Zulil out. Far out. Between the fungus, pollution, losing their habitat, it seems like a lot of amphibians all over the world really need our help. You're quite right, Roberta. Frogs are disappearing from habitats all around the world. And half of amphibians are at risk of going extinct. That means disappearing from the world completely. We can't let that happen. I think I know what to do. I can use my videos for good. I want to spread the word about just how amazing amphibians truly are. And I want to inspire others to help save them. I think I'm finally ready to debut my first video. Tadpoles at the start. Grow four legs and lose a tail. 
From Sicilians underground To axolotls in Mexico Half of them are endangered If they're extinct, then they'll be gone Reduce pollution, reuse Help the San Diego Zoo Amphibians can live on water And they can live on the land Rockin' can be a frog protection Their skin is slimy Slimy! Slimy! Bravo, Roberta, bravo! That was brilliant! That was fantastic! You are the world's only singing zebra! I love that! You need to do that more often! Forget about the jokes and start taking up singing! Roberta, Michelle and Olivia would be so proud of you! But sadly, we've come to the end of another episode of San Diego Zoo Kids Corner. Kids, if you had fun, we hope you'll join us again for another episode. Tell your friends to join us as well. And remember, if you've got any jokes, stories, poems, questions, or even a picture of a frog in your community, make sure to email us at zmail, Z stands for zebra and zoo little, mail at sandiegozoo.org. And if we use your joke, your story, your poem, your question, or the picture of a frog, we'll make sure to mention your name as well. I am so excited you joined us for today's episode. And I'm looking forward to our next visit where we can do more exploring and wondering about nature. Keep asking those questions. See you soon. Stay curious, my friends.